I've got to explain how I, I first started to talk about ordinary folk as opposed to tell jokes, because I used to do the basic joke years ago. I used to come on and, 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 and do jokes like the little old Jewish fella who'd been thrown out of Russia and, and they're searching his bags before he leaves, and they open it up and they get out a bust of Lenin. And one of the guys at, at, at Moscow Airport said... Uh, What's this? And the little Jewish lad said, No, what's this? He said, Who's this? He said, That's Lenin. He said, That's the greatest leader that Russia ever had. He said, He was a wonderful man. He said, When I get to my little place in Israel, I'm going to put him on the mantelpiece and I'm going to pray for his memory every day. They said, Thanks very much. So he goes out. He's going through the customs at uh, Tel Aviv airport. They open the bank to get the bust out. They said, uh, What's this? He said, What's this? He said, Who's this? He said, That's Lenin. One of the worst people that ever lived. He said, He persecuted everybody. <laughs> Curse of the ordinary folk, he said. When I get him on my mantelpiece, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneer at him every morning. And he gets to this little kibbutz he's staying in, in Israel, and his son said, Dad, who's that? And the old fellow said, not who's that, what's that? <laughs> Three kilos of gold, that's what that is. So. <laughs> I used to do things like that, and then I, I suddenly realised that, that people are funnier than jokes, and it's true that, isn't it? You listen to ordinary people. Watch them. See the things they do. Like they, you know, the bloke who saw the sign, stainless steel sinks, and wrote underneath, of course it does. <laughs> bloke went into the, into the fish shop. He said, give us a pair of kippers. The fellow said, we haven't got a pair left. He said, well, give us two odd ones. You won't know the difference. <laughs> we had a, a, a daytime programme on BBC a television called The Road Show. We took that all round Britain live. And I, I'll never forget a thing like that happened. And I actually saw it. We were driving into Londonderry. At the time, they'd brought out the Anglo-Irish Agreement that no-one agrees with. And <laughs> on a wall in Londonderry, somebody had sprayed, Ulster says no. And underneath, a bloke had put, but the man from Del Monte says yes. <laughs> But I've got to tell you how I first realised that people are funnier than jokes, and this is an absolutely true story. It, it happened to me, oh, years and years ago. I, was, I just started working the clubs as a, as a kind of a guitarist, and uh, I got a phone call from my agent, and he said, the club you're working tonight, he said, uh, the top of the bills had trouble with his car. Will you give him a lift? I said, OK. Now, it was the first time I ever met a man called Freddie Parrotface Davis. Do you remember Freddie Davis? Yeah. Funny man. He's in management now. Very funny comic. The youngsters have missed him. It's one of the, the blights, really, on the, on, the, on the youth of Britain, that they've missed comics like him. He was extremely funny. And I'm giving him a lift to this club, you see, but nobody's told me the man is a lunatic. <laughs> so I'm driving along in this little old banger, and as we're going along the road, there's, there's a lady at a bus stop. And Freddie said, Stop the car! Stop the car! <laughs> now, I think he knows her. So I pulled across the road, wound the window down, he leaned across me and he said, Excuse me, love, do you know where Kingfield Street is? She said, No. He said, Well, you go up here, <laughs> turn left. Do you know that woman stood by my car <laughs> saying, Hmm. <laughs> and as we drove off, she was thanking us. Thank you. And I thought... <laughs> Who needs jokes with people like us? But these things happen. I mean, one of, one of the funniest things I ever saw in my life was in a paper. I mean, have you ever read newspaper things that go wrong? I was, I was down in the, in the West Country. I was doing a season in Torquay, and I read this in the Torbay Herald. Front page news, honest to God, it was about six years ago. Two fellas from Devon, two local lads, had gone duck shooting on the moors. And they're driving around looking for somewhere to shoot and they stop at this farmhouse and one of them gets out the car, goes into the farm and said, excuse me, how much would you charge for us to shoot on your land? And the farmer said, listen, I'll tell you what, do me a favour, you can shoot for nothing. He said, what is it? He said, well, the vet's been down and he's condemned me horse and I haven't got the heart to kill it, would you do it? <coughs> but I said, yeah, poor old thing, I'll get him for you, close up, yeah. He gets back in the car but he doesn't tell his mate. <laughs> and they're going up this lane... He suddenly pulls in, gets out with a gun, his mate's behind him. He goes up to this field and he said, I think I'll start on something big. Bang! And shot the horse. And his mate said, so will I, and shot a cow. And his mate got six months jail, and it's in the paper. I mean, where could you go? Isn't it wonderful? And... and what really pleased me, and I've got to tell you, Pat and I were doing a show recently at Buckingham Palace. We were talking about, you know, the funny things in Britain and royalty. And this person said to me, have you ever heard the Queen's favourite story about Tommy Cooper? 
I said, no. And I thought I'd heard all the Tommy Cooper stories because I'd worked with him a lot and he was a good pal of mine. And, and there are millions of stories about him. And, and probably the greatest thing I ever witnessed about Tommy Cooper, I was, I was doing a cruise ship and, uh, and, and we docked in Egypt and Ray Allen and I, the ventriloquist, and our wives went to one of these stalls in a market and it was full of fezzes. <laughs> and as we're walking up, this Egyptian fellow said, you English? We said, yeah. And he put a fez on and he went, ah. <laughs> And we, we said, do you know him? He said, who? <laughs> we said, Tommy Cooper. He said, no. I said, well, why did you do that? He said, everyone from England puts one of these on and goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we know the man, but I'd never heard this story, and it's got to be true. If the Queen likes it, it's got to be true, right? <laughs> it's a legendary story, apparently, and it's the Royal Variety Show, the television version, right? Because there are several others that, that aren't shown on the screen. And if, you, if you've ever seen the show, you must gather that when the show's finished and the commercials or whatever come on, that's when the royals meet the entertainers, you see. And, of course, when you do a show like that, you go through the whole drill beforehand. You mustn't speak to the Queen unless she speaks to you, and you mustn't shake her hand. You put your hand out and she shakes yours. That's so you don't squeeze it, you see. So that's the score, and along the line are coming the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, Princess Anne, Lord Delphont, and about 10 or 12 hierarchy people. And in the line of entertainers, you've got Shirley Bassey, uh, Kirk Douglas, Linda Evans, Tommy Cooper, Bob Monkhouse, and so on, you see. And the rule is, of course, as the Queen is talking to one person, the one, the one in front of them has got the Duke of Edinburgh, and then Princess Anne, and they all shuffle along one. And Tommy Cooper's in the line, he's been on early, and he's had a chance to have a few. Now, <laughs> he hasn't gone, but he's swaying. You see. <laughs> and the Queen came up to him and said, Well done, Mr Cooper. He said, Thank you, Mum. And the Queen moved on. And as she moved on, Tommy said, Excuse me, Mum. And everyone went, Uh-oh. Because <laughs> the Queen's got to come back now, you see. But so has the other 11. They've all got to shuffle back as well. <laughs> and the Queen said, Yes, Mr Cooper? And Tommy said, Do you like football, Mum? And the Queen said, Not particularly. He said, Can I have your cup final tickets? <laughs> Is that brilliant? You can't buy that, can you? I mean, where can you go in the world to find folks? And you see, I was very lucky because I was a teacher at the same time as, as working in the, in the clubs in the evening. And, of course, I was able to watch children. Because, to be honest, and we're amongst our own here now. You know and I know that children are the most wonderful people in the world, aren't they? They're innocent, they're harmless, they're funny. But they're deadly, aren't they? Kids are deadly. And... I collect stories. I collected stories from when I was at school. And when I meet teachers now, they say, here's one for you, Tom. I've got a cracker, you know. And the latest one I've got was a pal of mine who actually teaches in a fairly big school. And he mostly teaches the, the older boys and girls. But this particular week, they were short of someone to, to take the juniors, the nine-year-olds. And they said, you don't have to do much. You know, do a bit of sport with them. Just fill in for the morning. He said, in fact, they've got a swimming lesson. You can take them to the baths. So he's got this class of nine-year-olds. He hasn't taught nine-year-olds in his life, right? And he's got them in the local baths. And he says, right, kids. Tell you what we we'll do, special treat, as it's me, we're going to have a race. Oh, great, sir. He said, right, it's one length of uh, the pool, swimming underwater. <laughs> and this kid said, um, are we allowed to breathe? <laughs> and the teacher said, don't be silly, what would happen if he breathed underwater? And another kid said, he'd be disqualified. <laughs> Because they're lovely, aren't they? And I, I even believe children's stories when I know they're not true. Do you ever want things to be true? I, I, I really hope that the, that, that the story about the school nativity play really happened. It's the school Christmas nativity play, and it's with the infants, you know, the under sevens. And, of course, infants are brilliant. You can do anything with them. They're like plasticine. You can mould them any way you like. They'll do anything for you, but don't let the parents in the audience. Because parents, that's the only time they bottle out is when the parents are watching them. So you've got the school nativity play, they've rehearsed it all week, it's perfect, and opening night, and the curtains open, and everyone's mum and dad are out there watching them. And on come Joseph and Mary, and Joseph knocks on the inn door and says, May we stay here for the night? <laughs> and the innkeeper opens the door, sees his mum and dad, and he's gone. <laughs> Eyes have glossed over, and he says, Clear off, we chocker. <laughs> Well, now Joseph's gone now. He's finished, right? <laughs> He's on his back legs. He's gone. And he says, but my wife is having a baby. And the innkeeper said, well, it's not my fault your wife is having a baby. 
And Joseph said, well, if you read your Bible, you'll find it's not my fault either. <laughs> That's got to be true. And I'm talking about meeting people in, in, in strange situations like that. I've got to tell you that the, the oddest thing is when people react to you. You know when you become a face on television or on film or anything like that? People's reactions are, are amazing. I remember hearing a story about a, a, a smashing actor called Harry Locke. You may not remember his name, but if you saw his face, you'd say, oh, yeah, Harry Locke. And uh, he was walking up a street in London not all that long ago, and a fellow stopped him and he said, excuse me, you're Harry Locke, the actor. He said, that's right. He said, 37 years ago, you made a film called The Red Beret with Alan Ladd. He said, that's right, I did. He said, you played a sergeant major in the paratroopers. He said, yeah. He said, you were killed very early on in the film, weren't you? He said, yeah. He said, do you want to know what happened after you died? <laughs> and people react to faces. I mean, I've had people say hello to me and don't know who I am. They just think they know you. And this is particularly true when you do a game show. When you do a game show on television, first of all, everybody thinks you know all about it. So when I was doing Name That Tune, I'd get in a lift with music playing and people would say, go on, what's that? I don't know. I mean, I have it now. I do a game show called Crosswits, and it's a crossword puzzle game. I was on a train recently going from Leeds to Glasgow, and I was doing a crossword. And a fellow walked past, and he said, if you're interested, seven ups lemonade. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but I've got to tell you, the funniest thing, the funniest thing of all about, about doing game shows is the bits that you never see on television. You know everything on television is recorded. You know that, don't you? You know the news is 10 years old. <laughs> Moira Stewart's 81. And... Do you know why that is? It's so that they, they won't let you see the mistakes, which are actually funnier than the programme. If you, if, you, if you watch the mistakes, you wouldn't watch any programmes after that. You, you just want mistakes all the time. And I, I, I didn't realise that till the first time we ever did name that tune. I'm going back a long time, 1976, I think it was. And we had a lovely couple, could have been your mum and dad, two beautiful people to play the game. Good at music, nice. I wanted them to win everything. But petrified were they. I mean, absolutely stone cold, frozen. I mean, gone. And game shows in those days, they weren't as popular as they are today. So, I mean, now you see games on all the time and people get used to what to say and how to behave when you're on it. These people had never seen this game before for a start. It was brand new. And they were absolutely frightened stiff. We put some drinks in them and what have you. And we've got them on the set. And they're so frightened that the producer said, listen, we won't even have a dress rehearsal. Let's go for it because these people just might collapse on us. So let's just go for the game. So they start the cameras and we're away. Now, you know the wheel in Name That Tune. You know when it goes round, makes an electronic noise that goes... Nee, 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 nee. Do you know the first time I ever spun that wheel? It went... Nee, 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 nee. And the lady said, my way. <laughs> and I thought, you can't possibly have worse than that, but we had it. We did a two-year a two tour of Name That Tune around holiday camps and civic halls. This is true. We did it live on stage. And, of course, the trouble with that is you've got to make sure that the people you get on stage, first of all, want to play the game, and secondly, I've got some idea. So we used to audition the audiences. When we, if I was doing, like, a civic hall or a theatre somewhere in the town, I would audition the audience myself. And you had all the gags for auditioning, you know. We're going to play some music, all write the answers down, and all that business, you see. And uh, I used to say, now, don't be cheating, because there's nothing worse than jokes like the two Irish fellas who went for the job, and the boss said, you've got to have an intelligence test. You know that one. And he marked the papers and he said, you've both got nine out of ten, but I'm giving Mick the job. And Pat said, why? He said, because you both had the same question wrong, but he had, I don't know this, and you had, neither do I. <laughs> See, so... <laughs> so we're doing this tour and we're, we're sponsored by one of the radio companies and they're given all kinds of prizes worth hundreds and hundreds of quid. So we said, right, wherever we go, we've got to make sure people can play the game. So we're doing a tour of some holiday camps and we said to them, why don't you audition the audience before we get there? They said, what do you mean? We said, well, we'll send you a cassette of maybe ten standards like Saints Go Marching In, Tie Yellow Ribbon. You play them to the audience the night before. They write the answers down. We come in on Sunday, mark them and pick the best two. And all the, all the camps said, yeah, except one. One camp decided the best way to get two people to play Name That Tune was to have a spot waltz. <laughs> I mean, why? Just because your feet move, it doesn't mean your head works, you know what I mean? <laughs> now, can you imagine you're sitting in a bar on, on your holidays and the fellow says, Ladies and gentlemen, spot waltz. You dance with your husband or your wife. 
So I end up with a married couple. Now the camp commandant come up, he said, hey, these two are married. I said, I know. He said, well, all the prizes will go to one Shelley. I said, yeah. He said, they'll be murdered when the others find that out. They'll be skin and air flying. He said, you'll have to pretend they don't know each other. I've got this couple being married 32 years. <laughs> pretending they're strangers. Playing bidder note. Do you know the one? I'll name it in seven. I'll name it in six. I said, right, I'm going to read the clue, and your highest bid is seven notes, your lowest bid is one. So I read the clue, went to the lady, I said, start the bidding. She said, I'll name it in seven. I went to her husband, he said, I'll name it in eight. <laughs> and she said, let him name it or he'll sulk for the rest of the holidays. <laughs> but isn't that typical? Isn't it what I've said all along? We are the funniest race of people. I know in the audience right now, we've got folk who, who came from where I, I, I came from originally. Is that right? We've got some of my expatriates over here. Can I just explain for those people in, in the rest of the world who may be listening right now that uh, it's a wonderful spot, our hometown, isn't it? It's just smallish. I know that. It's a small little place. In fact, the fire brigade's a four-year-old bedwetter. But it's a small place. <laughs> but we had a... We had a lovely house there, semi-condemned. And... Uh, <laughs> People wipe their feet going out. and uh, Very intimate, small little house. When you poke the fire, you knock the fella off his bike. But in the days when I was young, and I'm not going back a million years now, but can I take you back to the days when you and I were a bit younger than we are now, and there were characters in your street. Do you remember the streets? They were full of strange people, weren't they then? Like borrowing Bertha. Do you remember her? They'd come over. Do you remember? Dude, there's a few. No, it's true, isn't it? She'd come and say things to your mother like, um, can I borrow four pounds of flour, two pounds of butter, half a pound of lard and some raisins because I found some soda and I'm thinking about making a cake. <laughs> they, were tr they were true life people, those, weren't they? I remember this woman came to our house and she said to my mother, can I borrow your clothes line? And my mother said, I'm sorry you can't. We're using it to tie up some loose sawdust. <laughs> and the woman said, you can't tie sawdust up with a clothesline. And my mother said, it's amazing what you can do with a clothesline when you don't want to lend it out. <laughs> I mean, that was a wonderful time, that, wasn't it? And do you know what worries me today? The youngsters of Britain will never see that time again. They'll never see that time when fun used to be free. Do you remember those days? Before expensive toys, 50 quid a knock. You've bought toys at Christmas, you know what I'm talking about. Do you remember when fun cost nothing? Do you remember the thrill the first day you put your hand under your arm and went... <laughs> <laughs> never cost you too bad, did it? Do you know if they... If they made me, if they made me prime minister for one day, I don't only really need one day, I would bring back the things that we had that our kids will never see. You think about the things we had, you and I. Saturday pictures, they don't have them now. Do you remember the Saturday morning pictures, eh? Do you remember those days? You and me, two hours in that picture house. Nobody watched the film. We all ran around fighting and throwing things. And the manager come on the microphone. Do you remember him? If another missile... <laughs> ..hits this screen... ..I shall cancel the serial. <laughs> and the people we queued up to see. Do you remember them? Hopalong Cassidy? Hey, Flash Gordon? Sabu the elephant boy? Do you remember him, Sabu? 87 he is now. <laughs> Even the elephants have forgotten him. <laughs> but I tell you what we do, in honour of those days, let's do a song. Let's do a song that takes us back to the days when you and I were a little bit smaller and hopefully reminds you of some of the things that you and me really did.